When Lightning Comes in a Jar, written and illustrated by Patricia Polacco. Today is my family reunion. I can hardly wait. My dad's side of the family will come soon. It's been ages since I've seen them all. Before, our reunions were always at my grandma's house, but this year it's going to be at mine. I'm anxious to see my cousins, especially Lydia and Sandy. They will be wearing the same colors that we always wear at family reunions. They wore them at our last reunion. How I remember that day, Grandma and I stood in the front window waiting for my relatives to come. I can't wait to see them all, I said to her. I know, she answered. Will there be jello, like there always is, I asked. Yes, she answered. And baseball and croquet, like they all, there always is. And bag races, too. And will you tell me stories like you always do? Might, Grandma said, looking up at the sky. And we might catch lightning in a jar. Lightning in a jar, I asked. This was new. And then my relatives started driving up by the car load, one after another. Finally, the car I was waiting for rolled up and my cousins piled out. Sandy, Freddie, Billy, Lydia, and Carl. Sandy, Lydia, and I squealed and ran for the porch swing, just like we always did. We held hands and pushed the swing with our bare feet. We told secrets that we had kept for a whole year. I told them about the lightning in a jar. When my dad called out, Who's going to help unload these baskets from the car? We shouted, We will! And we lugged baskets full and heavy to the tables in the maple grove. Wonder how many jello salads there will be, my cousin Freddie asked. Gazillions, there always are, my cousin Billy answered. Sure enough, there were gazillions. They jumped and shook every time we bumped the table. They seemed alive. But there will be as many meatloafs too, my brother chimed in. There they were, as we unpacked them, zillions of meatloafs. They were all different, too. Each auntie had her own recipe, including Aunt Bertha, who made one with a hard-boiled egg in the middle. We, When we cut it, there was a perfect slice of egg, like a giant eye. Our aunties and grandma flitted around the tables like butterflies going from flower to flower. They perked up the lettuces or rearranged the tomatoes and set slices of meatloaf so they looked perfect. When Grandma and the aunties took off their aprons, we all knew it was time to gather at the table. We all held hands. Uncle Wayland said the blessings. Then everyone sat down and dove into the food, piling it high on their plates, some as high as haystacks. My brother Richie was sitting with some older girls that came with our older cousins. He was acting silly. I could tell he liked one of them. Embarrassing. When we thought we couldn't eat any more, Grandma and my aunties put their aprons back on and started getting all the pies and cakes from the kitchen. There was something magical about my grandma and her sisters this day, like they knew something they weren't telling. I did wonder how Grandma was going to catch lightning in a jar, and ever so often I'd stop her and ask her how. She'd just smile and say, easy, someday you'll do it too. After we ate, it was time for our annual baseball game, my dad and uncles against us kids. Batter up, my dad called out as my cousin Billy stepped up to home plate. Lucky he was on our team. He could hit anything. When he was out at field, he'd leap into the air and make impossible catches. That kid can jump higher than a cow's back, our uncles used to say. First pitch out, Billy hit the ball so hard it clean disappeared. We thought we saw lightning as it hit the sky. Maybe the lightning was on its way. Was that what Grandma was going to catch in a jar? I'm going to be a Detroit Tiger someday, Billy said that day. We all knew that he most certainly would. Next it was time for Coquet, the biggest game of the day, which our uncles kept interrupting with friendly quarrels about bent hoops, crooked wickets, and wanting to take reshots. We had bag races, watermelon seed spitting contests, and rides on Grandpa's draft horse, too, until Grandpa waved a yardstick in the air, all of us kids dropped what we were doing and ran to the milk shed. We knew it was time to get measured. We did this every year. I liked looking at the marks of my grandma and her sisters and brothers on the same doorway, some shorter than mine. Hard to imagine that once they were little, just like me. Aunt Bertha had gone to the house and fetched all the family portrait albums. The auntie showed us old brown photos and pointed. That was their father, who saved souls as a circuit preacher when he wasn't farming. Look there, were their favorite horses. Their eyes sparkled when they showed us their wedding pictures. 
The aunties were all married in their mother's parlor. I watched Grandma to see if she would summon the lightning from the sky. It's time for our family photo, Aunt Iva called out as she jumped up and grabbed her camera. We kids didn't like this part because it meant that any dirt on our faces would be scraped off with a hanky that our aunties had spit on, especially mine. Everybody smile, Auntie Iva sang out. After this, the kids started to chant, Stories, 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 please. Grandma and her sisters and brothers started quiet and slow. Uncle Ernest told about milking cows faster than lightning. Grandma told about how she and her sisters walked seven miles to a one-room schoolhouse over in Locky Center, and how each of them had taught in the same school. Then there was some quiet as Aunt Iva started fanning herself. We knew she was getting ready. I remember the day I was driving the rig home from school when I came upon a real rattlesnake. We all looked at one another. Rattlers weren't around these parts, so we knew this was going to be good. That thing was all coiled up and shaking its tail. Not a rattling sound, something more like a loud buzz. Bell horse just stood there and shook. What did you do, Aunt Iva? we asked. Well, sir, I stepped out of the buggy, took my umbrella, put it smack in the middle of that snake all coiled up. It just wrapped around that umbrella. I knew if it struck me, I was a goner. We all leaned forward. So I picked it up, gave the umbrella a shook, sharp jerk, and flung that snake into Cecile Potter's field. Then I jumped into my buggy and galloped home, like the wind. All of my aunts and uncles laughed. Then a flicker of heat lightning sprang out of the horizon. The air didn't move. Was some magic going to happen? Aunt Ida fluttered her fan. We knew she was getting ready to top Aunt Iva's story. Have I ever told you children about the time I took a ride in the first newfangled motor car in this here county? No, the kids sang out. Well, sir, it belonged to Eldie Dunkel. My pa didn't approve of him. No, never. No, how. He's a wild kid, he'd rave. Don't ever want to see you with the likes of him. Then one day, when I was walking home from prayer meeting, he rolled up next to me driving the shiniest machine I'd ever seen. Aunt Ida stopped and fanned some more. What happened, Aunt Ida? we begged. Well, Aunt Ida crowed. I climbed right into that thing. Eldie shifted that contraption, making a terrible sound, and that roadster almost leaped right from under us. When we went so fast, my hat blew clean off. We were going to almost 40 miles an hour. We raced up Moyer Road, hurled around Eva P Peter's barn, almost flattened the Bender sisters' fruit stand, then howled down Deet's Road. We gasped, and then we skidded to a stop in front of Pa's barn. There he was, just a standing there. She stopped again and fanned herself. What did he do, Aunt Ida? What happened? We all pleaded. Not a blessed thing, she answered, and laughed so hard she almost dropped her lemonade. Heat lightning flickered again. There was a low rumbling of thunder off in the distance. Now I watched my grandmother. She smiled and gave me a wink. It was her turn. Well, sir, Grandma began, I was but a girl, out plowing, helping Pa with the fields. His team could pull those rows straight as an arrow. When the team reared and bolted and dragged me halfway down the field before I could free myself, when I stood up, there was a fierce and clattering roar in the sky above me. We all leaned toward her. It was like thunder and fierce lightning. She stopped and sipped her lemonade. What was it, Grandma? We kids begged. I looked up, waiting for the lightning. Well, sir, I couldn't believe what I was seeing above me. We crawled close to her knee. There, like a giant dragonfly with two sets of wings, growling and roaring, pitching and rolling, spewing foul-smelling smoke, she leaned forward. It was the first ever flying machine in the state of Michigan. We all clapped with delight. That would have been a perfect time for the lightning to come, but it didn't, and it was almost dark. I whispered to Grandma, what about the lightning in a jar? She adjusted her glasses and gave me a look. Have the last rays of sun left the grass, she asked. I looked real hard. Yes, I said. Then sit down, child. Aunt Bertha brought a wicker laundry basket full of glass canning jars and set them at Grandma's feet. Many years ago, when your aunties and uncles and I were but children, our grandpa showed us what I am about to show you. She leaned down and touched the grass, cupping something in her hands. 
She thought for a moment and then said, Shadows lengthen, the day near done. Birds fly low at setting sun. Stars will rise from earth below, and these hands their light will glow. Come up, lightning, come up, stars. We'll snatch you up in these here jars. She blew into her hands and let something go. It flew for a moment, then landed deep into the grass. We watched and watched, but nothing was happening. Low thunder rumbled just above us. Look, my cousin Billy called out. A small burst of starlight puffed up out of the grass, then more and more drifted up out of the carpet of lawn beneath our feet. Fireflies, we called out. We grabbed the jars and the dash was on to capture lightning and put it in the jar. Grandma gave me a knowing look and smiled. When everyone had gone home that night, Grandma and I sat on the porch swing together. We looked at the flickering jar, and even though fireflies are common in Michigan on summer nights, never had I seen so many as that night, and as long as I live, I'll believe that somehow Grandma called them up with her stories and her magic. That night seems so long ago, but the reunion is here again. My family is arriving now. My heart is racing. We'll eat scrumptious jello and meatloaf, play baseball and croquet, spit watermelon seeds, and scroll new measurements on my milk house door jam. We'll look at photo albums. We'll laugh at some and cry at others. We'll remember the stories, how Grandma saw the first flying machine and Aunt Iva conquered the rattler. We'll talk about Billy and how he should have been a Detroit Tiger, but gave his life for his country in a war far away. Then, when the sun is low and the shadows long, we'll all sit and fan ourselves in the shade of the maple trees. Only a new crop of children will gather at our knees. My father, my grandmother, my aunts and uncles are no longer here, so now it is we who must tell their stories and bring them back for fleeting moments. Then I will show the children the magic that my grandma showed me. I'll call the stars from beneath their feet, and as they rise in the warm night air, these children will leap as high as a cow's back to gather them up. I'll send them home with full bellies, tired bones, and flickering jars in their laps. Their hearts will be overflowing, full of lightning, put there by folks who loved them even before they were born. Grandma knew this well. She also knew that some day they would tell their children about all of us and of the magic nights we caught lightning in a jar.